We are wrapping up Ezekiel. What an amazing study this has been. Bittersweet. Don't feel like I've done it justice, but I've learned so much and so much still to glean and um, apply. Certainly as the Lord's word is faithful, it never returns void, but so much of what uh, is given as inspiration to Ezekiel is not for Ezekiel. It's more for us, you guys. It's more for this age in which you and I, this crazy age that you and I are living in. And uh, more spoken in the Bible about the age that you and I are living in than certainly the age that Ezekiel was living in. More spoken about the end of the age and how all of this would then roll into the crazy days to which you and I are called to be a light in a very dark time, dark world, crazy time. And all of heaven is leaning over and cheering you on and and, uh, wanting you to finish well, finish strong. There's great cloud of witnesses we're told in scripture that are just Like if you could just see, if we could just kind of roll back and and spiritually just sort of see the realm that surrounds us, they are cheering you on, wanting you to finish well, finish strong in your marriage. And that's what tonight is all about. Just not, and not really even only for your particular marriage. Like think bigger than that. We come tonight to celebrate marriage, this gift that God has given to us and something that he has defined and something that he has instituted and we stand for it and not against it as we come out tonight and celebrate. So come, come tonight and join us for that. And even if you're single, um, what a wonderful time of, of fellowship and inspiration of all that the Lord has for us. and. Uh, Bon and I are excited about it, the second uh, Sunday evening of each month. So go home, enjoy a little tennis. Yeah, pickleball. Pickleball, okay. Watch some football, take a nap. And then uh, come on back, great worship, and I think Brian will be here. Um, and uh, just kind of great opportunity to kick off our marriage study. Be fun. Promise you it'll be fun. Uh, Or just come for the Sundays if you just want that. It's going to be hot tonight and you'll want an ice cream Sunday. So that'll be great. Crazy days. Heard about the lady who went to get gas, put $40 in her car, went to pay, handed the guy two $5 bills. And he said, you're $30 short. She advised him that her $5 bills were identifying as 20s. And those are the days that we're living in. Didn't work. It's funny how they can twist it to work when they want. And um, It brings us here to this glorious, remarkable chapter here at the end of uh, Ezekiel's vision. And Lord, we thank you for all that you've shown us and pray that Holy Spirit, you'd stir hearts and just baptize us fresh and new in the reality that we here this morning are your temple where you have chosen to reside And um, may you be glorified in our lives and all that we find ourselves living for in our families. And uh, we love your word, Lord. Look forward to uh, an exciting, fruitful, abundant season that's ahead of us as we jump into Daniel, as we jump into the book of Acts. We just ask for a fresh filling a stirring that you'd fan the flames of the spirit. Fire us up, Lord, to live for you in these last days. Give you praise for that and for this time of um, fellowship together, communion, and even the crushing of the cups that we would die to ourselves and um, living for our flesh and we would 
Lord, seek you first and and live for your glory, both now and forever in Jesus' name. And everyone said? So this this chapter, look at this with me. You got it? Say, got it? This is Ezekiel 48, and the names of the tribes are given there, and the expanding of, of heaven gloriously is seen through this picture of the expansion of the temple, uh, as well as the expansion of the city of Jerusalem itself. And you could get lost in the weeds and we'll avoid doing that together, but I think it's important to sort of note that it's a challenge as he would wrap up this vision in terms of you and I living out our name as followers of Christ and not allowing our identity to somehow end up being altered by all that surrounds us and the confusion uh, that clearly uh, is just everywhere. This remarkable chapter of the expansion of growth that is going on here, it, it, it just sort of would dwarf the size of Solomon's temple in light of now what Ezekiel is receiving, and that's important. Don't shrink the Lord in your life. Let him, let him, let him be God. Let him, let, him, let him be great. Let him be glorious. And uh, I, I see that in all of these measurements and uh, throughout all of the... Um, Dividing up of the districts and, uh, and, and the tribes there that you see really in the first uh, 12 verses. Look at verse 12. And, and the district of the land that is set apart will be uh, to them a thing most holy. And, and again, don't like just think of it historically of something that, that Ezekiel is being given but this is to be our hearts and our lives and, 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 and all of our pursuits, that our hearts would be holy ground. Our thoughts would be holy, surrendered over to the Lord. We're told in scripture to take every thought captive unto the obedience of Christ. There would be this sense among us this morning that as both Joshua as he meets with the commander there, the army of the Lord, and just about ready to lead the people across the swollen banks of the Jordan River into the promised land. The captain turns to Joshua and says, take off your sandals. Buddy, you're you're on holy ground. And just sense that, just have that awe and reverence for the Lord. Same happens to Moses at the burning bush, right? Take your sandals off, Moses. You're on holy ground. And and here, that same picture is being given to us through Ezekiel. This is to be set apart, verse 12, and shall be to them a thing most holy. Then I love this. Verse 15. The 5,000 cubits in width that remain along the edge of the 25,000 shall be for general use by the city for the dwellings and the common land and the city shall be in the center. And so the measurements here of it all. And ultimately, I mean, it takes you, look at verse one just for a second. Let's just circle, let's look, these are the names of the tribes in the northern border, the road to Heth, Hethlon and the entrance of Hamath and Hazer and uh, Enon. These are actual places, dots on the map, pinpoints. But look at this, the border of Damascus, northward. And, and, and so, I, I don't know politically if you've kind of bought into this whole uh, peace sort of roll out of a two-state solution, but you kind of got to ask yourself, you know, if you're thinking that's going to solve the deal, where actually are the borders that we're talking about? Because here now, Israel is just all the way going up there to the north, as far as Damascus, growing, expanding. And and here, 
in, in, in 15, verse 15, look at 15 now with me. This is like 5,000 to, to 25,000 for the, for the general use of it all. And, and, and the measurements of the north side will be 4,500 and the south side, 4,500, the east side, 4,500, the, the, the west side, anyone want to guess? 4,500. So you have the square of this city and we've been there many times. I, I think like 30 times we've led trips and tours. And we'll go again in February. Lord willing, we'll go in February. We'll take uh, our junior and senior uh, classes from prep. And it just kind of becomes this just amazing experience, uh, which we've done in the past. And it's just a thrill. It's a privilege to be there for a part of that tour and to take the kids on. It's sort of like, you know, they've read the book and now they get to see the movie. The whole thing just kind of comes to life when they're there and just kind of, and then they're at the graduation and they're like, oh, you know, like, this is the best experience ever of, of my time at prep was going, going to Israel. And you just see the whole thing come alive. And a lot of you have gone on those tours with me. And we've walked around the city. And you can get up there actually on the city walls and, 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 and hike the ramparts. And it's, it's a cool hike. And the circumference of that that we would do in present time today pales in comparison to now what Ezekiel is being given. Please, let me just put it into perspective. Because here throughout Scripture, if you were to take the circumference of it all, and he just like goes on and on and on, he just like continues to sort of measure these things out. Look at verse 17, the common land of the city will be uh, to the north 250 cubits, to the south 250. It's all squared up. It's all even to the west, to the, to the, to the south. And the rest of the length alongside verse 18, the district, the holy section shall be 10,000 cubits to the east and 10,000 to the west. And adjacent district uh, of, the, of, the, of the holy section, its produce shall be food for the workers of the city and the workers of the city and the tribes of Israel will cultivate it. And, 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 and so if we were to be there right now, if we were just sort of like just a telepath, just like boom, 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 just like Ezekiel's being pulled up out of Babylon, taken over, showing this amazing trip and this tour and this visit of, of, of what when he left was in a pile of rubble and here God's like, hey, just take a look at what it's going to be. This isn't made up. This is sort of like Fairy tale, this is real, this is happening, it's gonna happen, this is, this is how it ends. And ultimately, if we were to be there together, let's just like be there together for a second, and we're like, let's walk this, this, this city, the, the circumference of the city, the city walls. In fact, in the days of Josephus, who's probably the most known historian that would kind of come alongside the Bible and put all of this into sort of a historical perspective, the circumference of the city in the days of, of, of Josephus would be the circumference of about four miles. And, and that currently is, is about what it is. If we were to just kind of just like a drop a map again that we've seen up on the screens of, of modern day Jerusalem and here you got the Temple Mount but, 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 but here this to which now Ezekiel is being given in fact look at verse 30 look at this look where we're going all this is going to make sense in a moment some of you are like I'm, I don't know this is here are the exits of the city in the north side measuring 4,500 cubits and the gates of the city shall be named after the tribes of Israel Three gates to the north, one gate to Reuben and Judah and, and, and Levi. And on the east side, uh, 500 cubits, three gates, one to Joseph, uh, one to Benjamin, the other to Dan. The south side majoring 4,000 cubits, three gates, one to Simeon, one to Issachar, one to Zebulun. These guys are all present, all represented. These, these sons of Jacob, some born to Rachel, some born to Leah, some not born to Rachel, some not born to Leah, some born to Leah's handmaiden, some born to Rachel's handmaiden. And yet here, present and accounted for in the fold, in the flock. And in, in, in fact, and, and I'd encourage you, just study it and, and, and look at it and the, and the names and how they line up. And, and, and even the foreigners that are included in. And as a Gentile this morning, you got to be pretty thrilled about that. Like adopted and grafted into this family. Beautiful. That they're all present and accounted for and in, in, in included in the whole deal. 
South side measuring 4,500 for Simeon and Issachar and Zebulun and on the west side, 4,500 and, and the three gates, one for Gad and one for Asher and one for Naphtali. And then this last verse, incredible, amazing last verse of the book of Ezekiel. Here we are. And all the way around shall be 18,000 cubits. Okay, just stop right there for a second. Pick up with me if we were to go there right now and just kind of like walk around the city. It'd be, and according to Josephus, like historically, it'd be, it'd be about a four mile trek. But here, all the way around, according to verse 35, 18,000 cubits, 4,500 square reeds, 4,500 cubits here all the way around, 18,000, do the math, that's the math, would be a city in the circumference of 37 miles. You're like, where does that fit? This is exactly the point. Make room for God. Make room for God in, in your busy lives, husbands. Make room for God in your busy lives, moms, wives, sons, daughters. Make room for God. He's, he's wanting to grow. He's wanting, he's wanting to expand. He's wanting to increase. Isaiah says in chapter 54, enlarge the size of your tent. Here the tent is being enlarged. And this isn't even heaven yet. This is now the new city of Jerusalem, the new temple of Almighty God that he will reside in and us with him for a thousand years while the devil's thrown into the pit, someone say amen. amen. Not around, hallelujah. You can still muck things up, but you'll do it on your own during those thousand years. And, 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 and then heaven, this is just like preview. This is the pregame. And we've already gone from a four mile circumference of a modern city in, in present day form to now a millennial city, a millennial city that is now the circumference of 37 miles. And then a, a, a new heaven, John's like in his vision, he's like, I see this new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. And it's, it's a cube, it's 1,500 miles. And it's a cube, it's like dimensional. 1,500 miles, that would be like from Denver, I'm going to Denver this week. I'm on, it's, it'd be like Denver to Boston. Denver to New York, that's 1,500 miles. Or from California to really to nowhere. I mean, it's kind of, to <laughs> California to LA to Little Rock. If you're going to Little Rock, anyone? Yeah. Um, so that's like 1,500 miles, like Denver to Boston, Denver to New York. And um, 1,500 miles, but then it's 1,500 miles high. So you put that into like, you know, like if you're in a hotel and you're staying on the, on the fifth story, you're on the sixth story, you're on the 10th story, you're on the top floor, you're on the 24th floor. This now in heaven with 1,500 miles, if you kind of put that into the, the perspective of, of, of stories, you'd have 8 million stories. This is heaven. This is your home that I'm describing. So, so now, with this, with this whole e e expansion, you can, be on, you, can, you can be on this plane, on, on, the, on, the, on, the fourth, on the fourth floor, on the fourth story, 1,500 miles, take you 25 days to go from border to border, from gate to gate, you're walking. But then you want to go up a floor. So that's gonna take you a half a million years just to tour at once, just to drop by once. And somehow we've been duped into thinking that heaven's gonna be a bore. 
And, and here the Lord is saying, no, just, 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 and, and, and some of you are like, I can't even get my head around it. Exactly the point. Enlarge the place of your tent, Isaiah would say. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes and, 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 and don't, please, shrink him down. You know why they're in this pickle? You know why they've been in captivity now for 48 chapters? Why? Shrinkage. They reduced him into something far smaller with now shared space than he ever deserves to have. You see the point? Don't shrink back, don't make him small, let him be big. He desires to, to, to dwell in us like this. God be massive glorious in our hearts and in our lives. We're going to study acts. Pour down on us, Lord, on our marriage. Heal our kids. Don't hold back. I mean, this should be our prayer in these days, that the word of the Lord, the word that was with God, the word that was God, the word became flesh to dwell in us, to move inside of us. We're, we're this temple in and, and, and our, and our hearts and our vision by faith should not be shrinking. Should be, should be increasing, it should be growing to the extent that now the town gets a new name. Did you know this? Jerusalem that has been called so many things throughout scripture, here now for the first time receives a new name. Here it has grown, grown epically in proportions. Now to 18,000 cubits, a 37 mile circumference and the name of the city from that day shall be the Lord is there. Jehovah Shema, a new name for God, remarkable name becomes the new name for the capital city of the people of God. The Lord is, this should be your name. My name, our name, the name of your marriage, the name of your family, the name of your home, your casita. The Lord is there. The Lord is there. Jehovah Shema, the Lord. The Lord is there. I've been delivered from a life of sin and, and, and death. What a thrill. Once again, and it'll be Christmas before you know it. And we'll be celebrating again with our cards and with our, I wrote a book on it. It's in the bookshop this morning called Presence. Pres a presence. The presence of the Lord is the presence of Almighty God, this God who, 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 who put on, came to dwell in us, Emmanuel. God with, that's his name. Isaiah says, you know what you're going to name him? You're going to name him Emmanuel, God with us. This explicit truth throughout the course of the vision to which Ezekiel is given is pointing to you and I, inviting us to become the place on the planet where he resides. The temple of the Most High, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit, and, 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 and the names then for Jerusalem become the names for us. Do you know, the Midrash is this book that comes alongside the Hebrew Scriptures, and it declares that within the Hebrew Scriptures, there are 72 names for Jerusalem. That'd be a good word study. Here's, the, here's the, just the small semantic, the city of righteousness, the city of faithfulness, Hephzibah. Jerusalem is called. Hephzibah, the Lord's delight. This, this, this is our name in Christ. We have become where he resides. We, we have be, this, this, this little pump and pecker of a little heart has become his throne. The city of righteousness. Hepzibah, the Lord's, you're the Lord's delight. I know what that does to you this morning. You are the apple of his eye. You are the sought after. Jerusalem is called the sought after city, the not forsaken city. I will never leave you or forsake you. Wow, guys. 
The love of God poured into our hearts. Don't hold it back. Don't shrink it. Don't dilute it. Don't diminish it. The city of Zion, the city of peace, Jeru Shalom. Same word. Jeru Shalom. The city of peace. The peace. I will give you a peace. I will give you, I will grant to you, my people, a peace that surpasses understanding. Truth. The city of truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth. He fills you with his truth. His word is true. It's hard to find anything these days that are true. This is true. And here are lives that are built on the foundation of truth become exactly the promise of the title of Jerusalem, the city of truth, and he calls us holy, holy. We gotta live up to our name. The Lord is there. It changes everything for whatever you have planned for the rest of your life, rest of this day, the rest of, 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 of your career, the rest of it all, the, the names of the city, the names that he calls us. There's some amazing roots in the name of our own city. San Diego. And I just think it's, I absolutely think it's fascinating. I think it's hilarious that right now, sadly, we got a governor who's absolutely determined to remove. What are you going to do? Change the name of our city? It's like, hey, no, what are you, I don't know what you're talking about. San Diego, derivative of Santiago, St. James. Like in total relation to the savior of the world and the expansion and enlargement and growth, primarily in this case from the south moving north of evangelizing this part of the world is where our city got its name. You gonna change that, Gavin? I know you're out to sort of turn LA, city of into some demonic hot mess, but it's the city of angels. This is a city named after St. James, Rancho Santa Fe. Anyone? Santa Fe in Spanish? Holy faith. You're like, I had no idea. I, I think that's probably the case with the most. But this is the namesake of the town. I, I, I live in Encinitas. Encinitas. We lived in Encinitas for 25 years. You know what Encinitas means? Little Oaks. I'm like, where? <laughs> yeah, it should be like more like uh, eucalyptus or palms. But the palms are dying off too. I guess the oak trees did. The little oaks, shrinkage. I don't want in my life to find the things that I should be living for undetectable. We, we moved to Encinitas 25 years ago. We found this little place on a busy street. And uh, a lot of people who know that we live there honk when they drive by. <laughs> Neighbors love that. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's just grown to become something over the decades. It's just absolutely emotional, affectionate. Beep, beep. Santa Fe Drive. I don't know if we could ever move because the Lord planted us on and and it's noise it's a noisy street but maybe it's time for our faith to get a little noisy Amen. to have a noisy holy faith right. yes. to stand out to be seen, not to be overgrown so that we end up losing our identity 
with a lot of other things that end up taking the place of what we should be known for. The Lord is there. Jehovah, Yahweh, Shema, he is, he is there and this is who he in this pivotal time of history has called us to be, who he's called us to live for, to live for him. And this runs itself amazingly throughout all of scripture. The Lord is there, the Lord is there. He's with him in the garden in the beginnings of the entire narrative. They took his presence for granted. Ended up buying into the deceptions of a serpent that crowded him out. And his presence remains. Even as they were then excluded from the paradise of Eden, the presence of the Lord was there. And yet you can find yourself politically in this age and season of life where it just, it does seem to be both the agenda of Sacramento and all to just kind of like try and convince people that they would be much better off in their public schools and teachers unions and just completely crowding them out altogether of classrooms and, 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 and life as a whole. Hey, newsflash, Gavin, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Where are you going to go? The psalmist asks this. Where are you going to go from for the presence of the Lord. Psalm 139, just beautifully, just kind of goes into this whole thing. It's like, where, where are you going to go? If you ascend into the heavens, hello, you're there. If I descend into the depths of Sheol, into the pit, he's there. Where are you going to go? And, and, and I think, incidentally, he laughs. Look at Psalm 2 with me real quick. Psalm 2, he, he laughs in all of the vain imaginations and, 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 and plots of a, of a man to think that somehow you can go and, 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 and live and, and, and reside in a city or in a state where God isn't. Just show me where that is, because here an entire psalm would be written, Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage? Uh, people plot a vain thing, and the kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens will laugh. You're going to what? What are you going to do? Oh, here's our plan. We're going to break away from you in, 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 our, in, our, in our schools, in our, in, our, in our companies, in our homes, in our marriages. And we're going to break away, break away, break the bonds in pieces, cast their cord, their cord, the Lord's cords. And he who sits in heavens laughs. The Lord will hold them in derision. He will speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. You see in this? Because you got to be really glad that verse 5 isn't the end of the story. Because it very easily could have been. It's like, okay, fine. You want to pull away from me? You want to do it on your own? Have at it. You want to make that bed? Sleep in it. That's not where the story ends. He could, in his deep displeasure, had said, Fine, sucks to be you, you're on your own. It's not how it ends, yet, everyone say yet. Yet Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. That's a name for Jerusalem. I've sent him down there on 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 a rescue mission to save them from 
from their selves. I've, I've sent them and I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. So everything that you're looking for, can I just sort of sum it up and get to the bottom line? Everything you're looking for in life is found in Jesus. That's the moral of the story. Everything you're looking for, everything you're looking to fulfill and accomplish is found in him. Ask of me and I'll give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possessions. That's wild. You'll break them with a rod of iron, dash them pieces of potter's vessels. It's just like amazing. It's like, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, judges of the earth, you governors and presidents and knuckleheads. Serve the Lord. Verse 11, come on, let's wake up from this. This is craziness. Come back. Stop living this prodigal, riotous. Serve the Lord. Rejoice with trembling, kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. His wrath is kindled, but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. What a, what a, what a, what a psalm, what a, what, a, what a picture. You take that to the very end. Look at Revelation, at Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21, here, here John's being given the exact same picture that Ezekiel is being given here at the very, very end of the book, the very end of Revelation. Here's how Revelation, we're seeing how Ezekiel ends. How's Revelation in verse two? And I, I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Well, that's clutch, that's huge. Starting a marriage study tonight. Look at all that's being celebrated in heaven. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and will be their God. Residing, present, never moving out, never leaving. Look at this. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Look at no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. The former things have passed away. You'll get to see him. Your faith will be made sight, all the blurriness of life and pain and regret, gone and not delegated to an angel. God's like, I personally. Will wipe away every tear from your eyes. And then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. He said, right, for these are the the words, these are true and and these are faithful. This is done, this is like, the culmination of, of, of all that he intended for and, 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 and desired from, from the very beginning and, and all the way through. I mean, I mean, how do you sum it up? You can't. The Lord is there and forever is desiring then to dwell the throne of our life. It's humbling, isn't it? It's like, wow. Lord, could I ever go, could I go from your presence? No, no, nowhere, that place, does, that place doesn't exist. He says, even if I descend into hell, you're there. there that, you know what hell is? Hell's you being alone for eternity, but aware of the presence of God in the fact that you were invited and chose not to go. What Jonah choose? Jonah chose not to go. And he, he, he goes down to Jaffa. This is like a little port city, still there today, just south of Tel Aviv. And he gets on a boat and sails in the opposite direction from where he was told to go. And it literally says in the book of Jonah, look this one up. You know what it says? Fleeing the presence of the Lord because he's told me to go to Nineveh, so he, he must be kind of camping out over there. I'm going this way. F- literally says, fleeing the presence of the Lord, he does. And, and, and that's what I think the psalmist is getting to there when he says, the Lord laughs. 
It's like, <laughs> watch this, Joe. Meet my whale. Right? All their feeble efforts. If we could only live. the greater consciousness and awareness of his presence. This is the first thing that happens to Moses. Look, look at Exodus with me. In, in Exodus, you know the first thing we learn about Moses? Okay, he's like born in this little basket thing and he's floating down the Nile and all. That's how it starts. But here in Exodus chapter 2, what's, what's the first thing after that? Now grown up, this kid, what's the first thing we hear about him? You know the first thing? Look at this, Exodus. And, and, and can I just say while you're turning to Exodus, I'm thrilled to be going into Daniel. Yeah. And I'm thrilled to be going into Acts. But can we just put this one down on our bucket list? I'd love to study Exodus with you. I, I, I just think all of it is just so relevant right now. It's time for a lot of people to leave their life of slavery in Egypt behind. I, I want to study Exodus. I don't know how we're going to fit that in. I'm trying to do a marriage study tonight, and I'm going to kick off Acts. I'm doing this and this. But just um, pray with me that we could add Exodus. Anybody feel? I'm just like, wow. Because the first thing we learn about Moses is what? Look at this, verse 11. You got this? Look at this. Came to pass in those days when Moses was grown. Have you ever seen this? That he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked, look at this, look at verse 12. And he looked this way and he looked that way. He saw no one. Now he doesn't look up. But he's looking, is anybody over there? No. He didn't even look that well either because he, 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 he looked this way and that way. And when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and he hit him in the sand. Now he goes out the second day. I mean, he is like deputized. He's got his badge on. He's just taking, taking charge. He's like, behold, two Hebrew men are fighting. He's like, hey, 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 why are you striking your companion? And he said, well, who made you the sheriff? Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Oh, maybe he didn't look hard enough when he looked that way. And now wait, because now it's all over town and he's on the run from the presence of the Lord. He runs to the backside of the desert and hides out for 40 years. I, I, I want us, church, I want us to aim to live in his presence. Not running from him, not, not thinking that somehow we're getting away with stuff or if, 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 if we're just clever enough, we can hide this thing. Paul the Apostle, when he writes, he says, in him we live and move and, and, and have our being. It's everywhere. Where are you going to go? I think it's either one or the other. You're, you're either going to try and outrun him as Moses now does on the run for 40 years, wanted, or you can just... You can come home. I mean, communion is the table of invitation to come home and just rest in his love and his forgiveness and his, and, and his, and his grace. You, 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 can, you can either try and out, where are you, how are you going to outrun him? You know, when, 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 when Esau realizes he's been duped by his brother, he's like, well, I can't really do anything about this while dad is watching. So you know what Esau says? The moment dad's gone, the moment dad's dead, I'm killing my brother. I'm gonna kill him. I'm gonna kill him for what he's done. He's, he is, he has tricked me out of my birthright. I can't really do anything about it until, until, listen, dad's always watching. And now, Jacob, like, like Moses, like Jonah, is on the run, fleeing 
from the presence, both of God and a brother that has declared, I'm gonna kill you. And you know what happens? Look at Genesis, look at Genesis 28. He, he runs and he runs and he runs and he runs and, 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 and he, it's, it's kind of funny. Verse 10 says, Jacob went out from Beersheba and went towards Haran. Anyone know where that is? That's where Abraham started in his whole journey of faith. He leaves the suburbs of the Ur of the Chaldees, he's Chaldean, and leaves that going where he does not know and gets to Haran and says, this is good enough. Listen, good is never good enough. And God's like, you ain't there yet. Come on, keep going. Enlarge your tent. Pull up the stake. Come on, we're going. And here Jacob circles back to where Abraham stops in his journey of faith, goes to Haran. And he he came there a certain place and he stayed there all night. This is verse 11, because the sun had set and he took one of the stones of that place and he put it under his head. He's got a rock as a pillow and he lay down in that place to sleep and he dreamed and behold a ladder. This is huge, this is clutch, look at this. Was set up on the earth and its top reached to heaven and there were angels of God ascending and descending on it and behold the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, and the land on which you lie, I will give to you. I'll give to all your descendants, and your descendants, this is verse 14, shall be as the dust of the earth, and you will spread, a, you will spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south, right? This is like the measurements and dimensions that Ezekiel is now given for the whole promised land. It's given to Jacob, and in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Verse 15, behold, I am, what? Say it. I am with you. And buddy, you got to know this. I will keep you wherever you go. I'll bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken. Jacob wakes up and he's like, God was in this place and I didn't even know it. Like, don't let that be your life verse. Don't be Steve for a second thinking that's a good verse to put on my tombstone. No! I was alive my whole life and the Lord was with me and I didn't even know it. Rather, much rather, take him at his word that he's with you and that he'll keep you wherever you go. He's like, wow, I'm naming this place Bethel, the house of God. This is where the Lord is there, man. And yet sadly, this becomes the dilemma for a lot of people who miss out burying God in a pile of forsaken, forgotten, historical sand. They move on with their life. Joseph has this dream like Jacob has a dream. Joseph gets this dream and all of a sudden he's being abused and bullied by his brothers. And, and thrown into a pit and slo- sold into, in, 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 into slavery. And read it, look at it. That was not in the dream. None of that was in the dream. And he's like, really? And maybe you feel like that, you know, sort of like at times. And now he's sold into slavery. He's working for Potiphar. And Potiphar's wife's lying about him, saying all sorts of nonsense and accusing him of stuff he's never even done, right? And he gets thrown in jail for it. Falsely accused, not in the dream, none of it in the dream. It was like, uh, hello, maybe, maybe somebody, uh, and, 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 then, and then there's this verse. Look at this verse, it's in, it's in chapter 39, Genesis chapter 39. You in Genesis? You're just kind of jumping around. Are you having fun? Yeah. I'm just showing you how this weaves its way consistently throughout all of scripture and why Jerusalem would receive a new name is because the, is, the Lord is there. And here, even in the midst of Joseph feeling like he's been forgotten about, certainly forsaken, lied about. Look at verse 20, Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison. 
a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. But the Lord, everyone say that. Say that out loud. But the Lord. But the Lord. But the Lord. But the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was there. He meets with Moses 40 years in the back of the desert in the burning bush. Take your shoes off, Moses. Holy ground, Lord is there. Jonah, can't run from me. Can't run from my presence. Where are you going to go? Jacob, then a rock for a pillow. I'm with you. Joseph. I'll work this out. What the enemy's meaning for evil, you'll see. The Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Maybe some unjust, unfair things have somehow found their way into the hand you've been dealt. And you're like, Does this make any sense? Well, it makes sense when you begin to realize that God says, not if you go through the fires, but when you go through the fires, I'll be with you. And not if you go through the floods, but when you go through the floods, I'll be with you. And when they turn on you, and and, and when they spitefully accuse you, I'll, I'll, I'll be with you. Here, here's, a, here's a promise. Here's a promise that's often taken out of context. And, and that's okay. It can stand on its own. But can I show you another one? Turn to Matthew chapter 18. Because this just isn't like Old Testament stuff. You get, into, you get into the New Testament. You get into the teachings of Jesus. You get into Matthew chapter 18. Some of you are like, Matthew 18? I know what Matthew 18. Yeah, Matthew 18 is when that brother sins against you. When that neighbor's kind of being, I was reading the other day and I had my books out and this guy kept coming past my table. He kept looking at my stuff on the table and, and he was like, I could tell he was really curious and he finally stops and he looks at what one of my books says and he goes, love your neighbor, huh? Because one of the books, said, he goes, love your neighbor, huh? And I'm like, yeah, love your neighbor. And he goes, my neighbor's a jerk. <laughs> That's what he said. My neighbor's a jerk. Go, really, what'd your neighbor do? He goes, well, we have these rose bushes. Here's what he said. We have these rose bushes. And he keeps stealing our roses. I just want to hand him the book. I just like, I, I wanted to hand him the book. I wanted to go to Home Depot and buy him like 12 rose bushes. He's a jerk. So when your neighbor's a jerk and you turn to Matthew chapter 18, look what the Lord says. Look what the Lord says. Verse 15, moreover, if your brother sins against you, he's a jerk. He's stealing our roses. Mother's Day, we came out to get roses on Mother's Day and that neighbor had stolen all of our roses. brother sins against you, you you, you tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he hears you, hallelujah, party in heaven, you've gained your brother. If he won't hear you, then take one or two more. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Now listen, if he refuses to hear them, then go and tell the church. If he refuses even to hear the church, then let him be to you a heathen and a tax collector. But assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two or three of you on earth agree concerning anything, it'll be done. Now, here's the verse we often like, we'll just like rip it up by the roots and just plant it wherever we want to use it. But look at the soil in which this verse is given to us in the promise of verse 20, where two or three are gathered together in my name. The context is conflict. And his promise is true. I am there. Jehovah Shema, I'm there. I am with you in the midst of even that. We're gonna start Daniel. And you get to chapter three in Daniel, and it's when the three Israelites get thrown into the fire. And what happens? What happens? The Lord is there. 
The Lord is there, you guys. May, you, may, may we, we never lose heart. May this just never come to an end, but a greater and deeper appreciation with every passing day that the Lord is with us. And this is the promise of your most favorite psalm of all psalms. It's your promise in Psalm 23 that, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why? Why? You're with me. You're with, you're with me. You're with me. You're with me and your rod and your staff, they will comfort me. I was thinking about our daughter-in-law, Hannah, and the testimony that she shared at the women's tea and her whole adoption story and how God has just proven, I mean, to all of us, but I just think of Hannah's story and Mitchell's wife and God's been there. He's been there for me and he's been there for you and wherever there is, he is there. You ought to tweet that. Wherever there is, he is there. So here's the quote that Lewis gave me that ultimately ended up changing all of this, kind of taking all of the scripture and putting it into perspective. Lewis says this, and we'll close. God's presence this is a game changer. At least it was for me. God's presence is not the same as the feeling of God's presence. And so many times that's exactly where the spiritual shrinkage in your dryer of faith, in the heat of the moment, ends up reducing, you're you're basing it all on feelings instead of on the very certain fact of his promise for his presence is not the same as the feeling of his presence. For he may be doing most for us when we actually think he's doing the least. He's there. And there is nothing that we should be more intentional about than allowing his presence to consume and enlarge and expand into all that we find ourselves living for both now and forever. Amen? Lord, we praise you and thank you for the book of Ezekiel. All that you have taught us about your love and your grace, your mercy that extends even to us today on this table. Lord, as we partake of this bread that represents your body that was broken for us, as we crush the cups, we crush, Lord, the thought, the very thought of living for anything other than your glory pray that you would just baptize us in your love, that you would wash us and cleanse us by your blood of every sin, of every stain, of every selfish deed that short circuits your glory in our life. Help us not to lose sight of you, Lord. Even as Paul in the book of Acts found himself out on the stormy seas for not just days, not just a week, but 14 sleepless nights. The Lord was there. He was able to say to all those guys on that ship, not a single one of you gonna be lost. Put your faith and your trust in the Lord. So in the midst of the challenges that I know a lot of people walked into church with, Would you show yourself strong? May we claim together that we are in the midst of the presence of the Lord. And may this become holy ground, your holy space.
do according to your will whatever you'd like with our lives. We avail ourselves, Lord, to you and surrender. Pray for clean hands and pure hearts. We just be baptized today in this communion service. The power of the book of Ezekiel just washing over our lives. May we become your temple place where you reside in residence, in praise, in honor, and in glory. For we ask it in Jesus' name. The church said amen. Amen. Let's all stand together. Come on, let's worship.